Hi, everyone. It's Joe Venary, the host of Fit Insider, the show where I talk with the entrepreneurs, executives, and investors who are redefining the business of fitness and wellness. Today, I'm joined by Brian Myers, the president and CEO of Solid Core, a Pilates-based boutique fitness brand with more than 70 locations across the U.S. In this episode, Brian talks about transitioning into the CEO role earlier this year. Then we discuss COVID's impact on the business, raising new capital to support expansion, and SolidCore's digital partnership with Equinox Plus. Brian also shares his approach to building culture and persisting through the pandemic. A quick reminder before we get into today's show. Every Tuesday, we send a weekly newsletter filled with insights and analysis on the business of fitness and wellness. Join other decision makers and industry operators by subscribing at insider.fit.co. Let's get into it. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Fit Insider. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Joe. Excited to be here. A lot to talk about today. And uh, we talked a little bit offline. I think a lot of folks know uh, Solid Core and maybe getting introduced to you as you've recently moved into the CEO role. So could you just introduce yourself and maybe give us like the update, what's going on at Solid Core? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, my name is Brian Myers. I'm the president and CEO of Solid Core. As you mentioned, Joe, a lot of people know who we are, but the 10 second version of, of who we are is we operate 70 plus locations in 20 states in the district and we offer a 50 minute full body Pilates inspired workout class. The current state is an evolving one. And so it's, it's an interesting time for us to be having this discussion. You know, we, we came out of what we thought was kind of the backside of COVID starting early 2021 as vaccinations were happening and numbers were, were declining month over month. You know, all of our studios were, were back reopened. We had just taken a round of funding and, and getting back to growth and um, lots of excitement. And frankly, there's still a lot of excitement in the business, don't get me wrong. But of course, we've hit some, some choppy waters here as the Delta variant has come into play and some of the more recent findings that the CDC has released, frankly, as of just earlier today, about the transmissibility of of the variant, even for vaccinated folks. And so the state of the state, like I said, is that we are evolving and, and taking it one day at a time as we learn more and see how local governments and public health experts are are reacting and adjusting our operations accordingly. Yeah, I think the best way to describe it is evolving and just continuing to to deal with it as it comes. I think trying to get to a lot of the things that you mentioned. We'll try to tackle them all, if not uh, most of them, but maybe in order. And I think it was maybe April, you kind of correct me on the timing. You officially moved into the CEO role. You had been involved with Solid Core before that. So can you just tell us about how did that transition come about? Why now? And kind of like what led to that move? Yeah, of course. So yeah, your timing is is spot on. So it was April that I officially moved into the role. But truth be told, Joe, this is actually a transition that has been in the works for quite some time. So as you mentioned, I've been um, a part of the Solid Core family for a while, three and a half years to be exact. And I joined as as chief operating officer. And our founder, a woman named Anne Malum, who is a serial entrepreneur. This is not her first thing. She loves the beginning stages of forming organizations and companies. And it was back in 2019, early 2019, that she started talking about, you know, the desire to start to pave the way for her to be able to create whatever happens to be next for her. Not that she had any imminent plans, but wanting to make sure that the company was set up for success. And through those conversations, you know, wanted to position me given my experience with the company to, assuming I continue to perform, of course, in my job, uh, to position me to, to step into that leadership role. And so the first move was to promote me to president back in 2019, late summer. So we did that in uh, September, uh, which allowed her to start to pull out of more of the day-to-day of, of the business. Again, setting the stage for what we thought was going to be a transition in late 2020. The, the goal was to take the company to market, to sell the company, and um, make this transition as a part of the sale. But obviously COVID threw a wrench and um, not just our plans, but but everyone's plans for, for 2020. But coming out of it, you know, once the company was getting back to sort of more stable footing, we started to think differently about capitalizing the company and went out for a growth equity round with BMG, who I know you actually had on your podcast as well. 
kind of put the plans back into motion and made the announcement in the spring and made it official as of April. Yeah, even even that a lot of moving parts as you're thinking about coming into this role. The I, I wasn't, you know, I had thought kind of from the outside looking in that potentially the the plan was to maybe sell the business and then obviously as the transition happens, the raising funding, COVID. What was some of the behind the scenes conversations? You know, you had been kind of moving into this role and taking over more and more of a leadership role from your perspective. Did you imagine yourself being the the kind of CEO and saying, hey, we are going to go out and, and raise a pretty significant round of funding and, and scale up? Or um, was that also an evolving situation in your mind that it the opportunity presented itself and you kind of seized it when it did? Yeah, that was actually honestly, more or less always kind of in in the plans was to, you know, even at the point in time that we were selling the company, we were selling the company, you know, going into that process saying, hey, we're going to have roughly 100 units by the end of 2020. And we're looking for the next partner who's going to take this to 250, 500 and beyond units. And so looking ahead to accelerated growth was a part of the playbook, even as we were talking about the transition before COVID entered the picture. And ultimately, what COVID did was forced us to press the pause button on growth plans as we kind of, you know, hunkered down and stabilized the business. It also forced us to innovate. And we can talk a little bit about that um, if we have time. But then sort of as the business started to recover and COVID started to wane, at least for a period of time, you know, we, we we wanted to be opportunistic and be prepared to take advantage of great real estate deals and landlords who are going to be hungry to find growing concepts. And that is ultimately what prompted us to say, yeah, maybe the time is not right anymore to sell the company in full, just given the amount of disruption. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be having the conversation about um, finding the right partner to, over the next three to five years, really continue to grow and expand the business on the heels of COVID, knowing that there are going to be some things that are working in our favor uh, coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. It makes total sense. And thinking about that, you go back to early in the pandemic, obviously creates a number of challenges for for all businesses and, and everyone really, but specifically for gyms and studio and the brick and mortar side. You know, Solicor was among one the the number of studios that had to lay off the, their staff, the majority of the staff in this case. And then you go through the transition at the CEO role, even though you had been involved in the company and this was kind of known. How have you gone about, I guess, A, rehiring folks, whether that's folks who had previously been at the company or entirely new staff, and then kind of solidifying that culture under you as you think about now expanding into the future. Yeah. So we were fortunate to pretty quickly, it didn't feel quick at the time, but when you look back at the actual timeline, it was relatively quick to secure a PPP loan. And, you know, we shut down our business in mid-March and we secured our PPP loan in mid-April. So it really was roughly a 30-day turnaround. And with that PPP loan, we were able to start to rehire our people in advance of reopening our studios. But it actually wasn't that long after starting to rehire that we started to hear that states and cities around the country were beginning to reopen. And we reopened our first studio the first week of May of 2020. And so, you know, honestly, Joe, you know, we went into that period of time, heads down, like trying to figure out the work. And yes, there was certainly some culture rebuilding, but to be completely transparent with you, in those early days, It was really, how do we operate in this new environment? What are the safety protocols that we need to have in place? You know, how do we communicate with our clients and get them back into the studio? What are their expectations of us? What is our team's expectation? There was just so much to do. And it wasn't really until we started to pull up a little bit as we got through some of those initial openings over the summer of last year that we really stepped back and said, okay, now that we kind of have our footing under us at least a little bit, how do we start to really rebuild trust with the team? Because as you can imagine, you know, no one expects the call that is a group Zoom where you have to tell everyone that they no longer have a job. And going through that experience 
for anyone will cause a level of unease and distrust. And ultimately, where we started to rebuild that was through communication and trying to be very transparent with the team about two things. One was how the business was performing. And we were, you know, we considered ourselves going into the pandemic a pretty transparent company and culture, but we tried to be even more transparent coming out of those initial shutdowns so that people understood here's the realistic state of the business. We didn't want someone to think that we were doing better than we were and things were more secure than they actually were. And we also didn't want people to think that we were on the brink of collapse. So we try to be really transparent about that. But the second thing, and equally importantly, if not more importantly, was give people insight into how we would make decisions going forward, whether that was decisions around salary cuts, uh, future layoffs, how we were thinking about studios that were under construction and when we would start those back up, but really create that framework so that people knew what to expect. Because at the end of the day, when there was so much mass uncertainty happening in the macro environment, it was our job to rebuild culture by providing a sense of steadiness to the extent that we were able to, even as there was sort of chaos ensuing around us. Yeah, I think that was really well put. And I'm sure the employees, the staff really appreciated that. You know, frankly, I've talked to a ton of different operators at this point, both on the digital side and on the brick and mortar side about navigating this. And I feel like you put it really succinctly and and had a good handle on, you know, what it's going to take to drive the business forward. And also, you know, build that trust with your people. I guess, how did you come to that? Was there somebody that you were kind of leaning on or tapping in terms of a mentor? Or was that just how you think about from a, a leadership and operator standpoint that, hey, this is this is the only way we're going to weather the storm? Yeah, look, I would be foolish and naive if I said like, look, it was my own brilliance. I'm sure it was informed by conversations we were having with board members, conversations I was having with other uh, peer business leaders and other peer mentors of mine. But What I will say to you is that one of my core values is understanding. And what I mean by understanding is placing myself in the shoes of the other to really get underneath the emotion that someone may be experiencing, the anxiety someone may be experiencing, and why they may be experiencing that. And I think through this time period, I did a lot of thinking about that, of, you know, what might our team be feeling that even, you know, they might not be able to articulate or may not be willing to articulate to us. And if I had gone through that myself, which, you know, I didn't lose my job, but I certainly, you know, came to news that like, hey, I'm going to take a 70% pay cut through this time period. And who knows when you're going to be able to go back to your full compensation. And like, how was I feeling? And like, if that's how I was feeling, like, magnify that tenfold because that's probably just the surface of how the team is feeling. And so I tried to do a lot of putting myself in our team's shoes through this time, through this time period to come to that realization that like, hey, really what they need is some semblance of stability because they're not finding it in the news. They're not finding it in their personal lives. They're certainly not feeling it in the traditional ways of like your health and financial security. And so anything that we can do to give our team a semblance of that is our duty as, as leaders, I felt. Yeah, absolutely. And you kind of, you know, you go about establishing that you, you mentioned getting the PPP loan, some of the studios actually opening as quickly as May. And at that time, I don't specifically remember what SolidCore did, but you know, you have a lot of brands immediately going to, whether it was Instagram Live or Zoom, just establishing some type of relationship from a digital product perspective. And then now to this point, you guys have established a partnership with Equinox, Equinox Plus, so you're available on their digital app. What was the the thought process around like, hey, how do we do out of studio digital at home? And, and what led to Equinox, this is the right partnership decision to make? Yeah, great, uh, great question. You know, heading into the pandemic, we had had some conversations with Equinox Plus and, and others about offering Solid Core on a digital platform. And transparently, we had kind of shied away from it. There was something really special about 
the community that you experience when you're in the solid core studios. There's something special about the small group nature of our classes. Again, for those of you who don't know, most of our classes kind of average around 14 to 16 people. You know, there's that accountability that you get from your coach who's calling you out by name, challenging you, pushing you that we felt was going to be hard to replicate. And then you have all of those things, but then you also have the fact that we have a custom built Pilates performer that's, you know, a few hundred pounds and 12 feet long. And so, you know, that's hard to replicate at home. But necessity is the mother of of invention, as they say. And so when all of our revenue went to zero on March 17th, as we closed all of our studios, we were like, we're going to figure out this digital thing. And we started with Zoom, um, like many of the brands um, that you just described did. And, you know, one of the things that was important for us through that was to keep those things that we just talked about that made Solid Core special, special. And so, you know, that community aspect that I, that I mentioned, you know, we would make sure our uh, coaches were on the Zoom at least 10 minutes prior and stayed on for at least 10 minutes afterwards. So that those before and after conversations that you get in the studios that create that community, that create those connections was still present. We also capped the number of people in our Zooms. And, you know, it meant we limited the revenue because we didn't have a hundred people or, you know, some Zooms I saw with some brands were doing several hundred people on a Zoom, but it kept the accountability and that coach client connection there. And it meant that a coach could look at the Zoom display and say, Hey, Joe, I see you doing those crunches on your toes. Way to go. Get one more rep. And that kind of accountability is what makes Solid Core special in studio. And so we were really, really happy with what we were able to accomplish in a relatively short period of time as we stood that up. That being said, as the pandemic wore on and we looked ahead to what might happen in a post-pandemic world, we recognized that there were a subset of our clients who may be changing some of their behaviors and either opting to supplement their in-studio workouts with an at-home workout, or I think in the rare cases, move completely digital. And we wanted to make sure that we did not lose the ability to continue to connect with those clients. And so we picked up those conversations that we had had with Equinox Plus pre-pandemic to sort of check in on what they were building. And ultimately why we felt it was the right match was because they were good at all of the things that we were not, (laughs) to be completely candid, right? We had a great workout, a great community, like some great brand fundamentals, but they brought the expertise of production, the expertise of casting, the expertise of programming, and had the experience doing that across a bunch of different modalities, had started to already gather data around what was resonating and could quickly deploy that um, with our workout in order to get us launched ASAP. And we knew that coming out of the pandemic time was going to be of the essence and and building that capability internally, which is going to take way too long. And so it was like, let's take our strengths and their strengths. And those two things together would benefit us from a time perspective and kind of create this perfect um, sort of match. Yeah. And I think they've also done a nice job as you, you would kind of expect given where they're positioned in the landscape of being a premium brand. I think Solid Core kind of fits that as well. And so there's a certain level of curation that goes with the brands that are involved there. And you mentioned kind of these trade-offs around they're doing some of the pieces that, you know, maybe they're better at than than you are, or it's just going to cost way too much money for you to go out and do this, or it's going to take too much time. To the extent that you, you're able to talk about it, I think it's, it's interesting and kind of new in just given the nature of like the collaborations that are taking place, the, the digital content providers with the, the hardware, with the, the people who are building platforms, like what are those conversations like? Are they paying you to be in the app? Are you giving them a percentage of revenue? Is that, do you have insight into who those consumers are that you get their contact information or their usage numbers? Like how does that partnership work? Again, totally respect, like you can't come out and maybe say all the details, but to the extent that you're able to talk about it. 
Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're spot on Joe that I, you know, it would be inappropriate for me to talk about all of the details, but what I will say is that it is a financially, it is structured as a mutually beneficial relationship that when we do well, you know, Equinox Plus is doing well. And when Equinox Plus is doing well, we're doing well. And that's the spirit of all of the partnerships that we aim to strike here at SolidCore, whether those be partnerships with vendors, whether that be partnerships with landlords, you know, even down to, of course, the way that we think about, you know, our coaches in studio, right? Like a rising tide lifts all boats, so to speak. And our financial structure with Equinox Plus is is, is in line with with that with that as well. The consumer piece and, you know, what data and information we have is an interesting question. And what I will say is Equinox has been an amazing partner from this perspective of really helping us understand who those consumers are, what their viewing habits and behaviors are. Because at the end of the day, our insight into that will help us bring better content to the table, which again, helps them and helps us. And so... You know, with again, without going into the nitty gritty, they've really made a point to be transparent with us to the extent that they have the data so that we can improve and they can improve over time. Because what we want to be is successful on their platform, and of course, what they want us to be is successful on their platform as well. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think to your point, it, it, it builds both of, like, if you know what's working, then obviously it, it's helpful to know that so you can do more of it. And then it benefits the overall experience on the app. Kind of one more question down the path of like these digital and at home, you know, I think the community point is well taken. Um, the experience, the fact that you have the reformer, it's like, how do you get that at home and replicate it? Like seems somewhat impossible, especially to the, the kind of quality of the equipment that you all have. And then yep. you see, I think one of the other brands that was in the similar boat is, is Barry's is that they're like, Hey, we can't replicate or, or how do we replicate this experience at home? And they end up launching an, an at home experience, they end up partnering with a hardware company in form. Do you have any thoughts as this continues to evolve? Like, can you, or will you also launch your own standalone at home digital uh, partner with an equipment manufacturer? Is it more exclusive to Equinox? Uh, what are the opportunities on that front? Yeah, right now we are, you know, really invested in, in our Equinox plus partnership and, and making sure that partnership is successful. But I think you raise a great question as it relates to hardware. And it's something that, you know, since we launched on Equinox plus earlier this year has been, a topic of discussion and debate conversation for us internally. And we have begun the work on a prototype of what an at-home machine would look like. And, you know, this would be an at-home machine that is not necessarily a connected piece of hardware, but is a piece of hardware nonetheless that facilitates the workout being even more effective than what it is today with, you know, the the sliders or gliders that that our clients are currently using. And so that's an ongoing conversation. Like I said, we are in in the prototyping phase. So it's um it's moving along. But you know, there there comes a point in time where you have to ask some of those questions of, you know, from a prioritization standpoint, where does this fit on the list? How big of an opportunity is the hardware going to be? for us and is the juice going to be worth the squeeze you know is it going to be a solid core specific piece of hardware or do we want to make it sort of a a broader pilates piece of hardware and market it um in that way and those are some of the more strategic questions that we're still that we're still tackling at this stage yeah for sure there's a lot to consider on that front and then Changing gears a little bit, obviously you have the core business, which is the the brick and mortar side. And, you know, with the new investment, looking at continuing to expand the number of locations, I think it was 70 as of the beginning of the year. Um, and you can correct me on the numbers. So call it 70. And now you mentioned looking at how do we get the business to 250, 500 locations, what is going on on that side as you're looking at expansion, keeping the existing studios open to the extent that the the mandates allow it, getting into construction and building out new locations? Um, what's the outlook there? Yeah, we are we're super excited to get back to growth, and frankly, we've we've already restarted the growth engines because you know whether the pandemic ends in 
July of 2021, or the pandemic ends in January of 2022, or July of 2022. We believe in the long-term prospects of our business, and we believe that consumers want to return to in-person brick-and-mortar experiences. And so that is why we felt confident re-engaging even before the end of the tunnel was totally clear, right? And so as it stands today, we have a number of openings on the horizon. In fact, we are opening a studio here in about a week and in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., right outside of the new Amazon HQ2, which we're super excited about. We have some openings happening in Texas later this year, some openings happening in New York City. And, um, you know, shortly behind those openings, we're also going to be opening on the West Coast, uh, which you'll hear more about in the near future from us. So we're really, really thrilled, you know, rough numbers, you know, over the next, let's call it 18 to 24 months, you know, we're looking at doing 40 to 50 studios over that time period. And so we're really not being shy about our willingness and excitement to be aggressive coming out of the pandemic and capitalize on what we think will be uh, a great real estate market and pent up demand for in-person experiences. Yeah, ramping up. You mentioned the, you know, potentially taking over uh, s- existing locations that maybe other studios are left behind, or maybe your point was just that just given the the availability of some real estate, those are creating prime opportunities. How are you evaluating those potential moves as you think about these expansions? Has that played a big role in it, or is it just that's a part of it, and you're just you know taking it as you think about um, continuing to expand? Yeah, more of the latter. It, I would say it, it's certainly a part of what we're looking at, but the vast majority of things that come across you know our team's desks that tend to be most interesting are not you know, what we sort of term second generation spaces that were either, you know, a former Pilates studio or a former spin studio or something like that, that we're repurposing into a solid core. Most of the spaces that are most interesting to us are kind of de novo spaces that are usually first generation spaces that a landlord, you know, just built a building and has this space that's delivering for us. But we are eyes wide open and will evaluate anything that, you know, sits within the crosshairs of, you know, kind of the demographics that lead to successful solid core uh, locations and the psychographics of who the sort of typical solid core clientele is. Yeah. And then as we get towards the end of the conversation here, one thing I definitely wanted to get your perspective on was just kind of on that, you know, brick and mortar studio side. Yes, we will continue to see more innovation in the digital at home. I think for all the players is whether it's omni-channel or hybrid or whatever the the word is that we end up going with uh, to talk about, you know, catering to the consumer, giving them the options that they want and letting them choose um, while still having that in-person experience. In kind of recent weeks, we saw F45 go public. They're kind of a, a single studio, but have launched a few other sub-brands starting in, in Australia. So potentially maybe adding some other concepts to their portfolio. Then you have Exponential, who is you know, a hold co, a a portfolio of boutique brands. How do you think about, well, I guess given their performance less than stellar, but again, in the midst of COVID, a lot going on, um, we'll have to see what kind of indication that actually is. How do you think about kind of the opportunity more broadly on the brick and mortar side as you think about potential liquidity at some point, probably not in the near term, as well as you know, the idea of having a a single modality concept with the Pilates as you now see the different portfolio brands and acquisitions that are taking place. Uh, How does that all factor into your thought process as you think about continuing to grow? Yeah, I think for, for the time being, we are really focused on doing what we do well, which is executing the solid core experience that our clients know and love. And I think it's sometimes easy, um, especially when you're, you know, our size, which, you know, I would kind of call us a, a, a teenager. We're not quite young. We're not quite a teenager. And we're certainly not an adult. We're sitting, you know, at 70 units. It's easy because you have enough resources at this size and scale to play some of those games and you're small enough and nimble enough to do it. It can be really easy to get distracted. And 
you know, I would not say that we have blinders on to the things that are happening in the macro environment, but the hurdle that we need to clear in order for us to really think about diverting resources away from the thing that we know we can execute very, very well is extremely high. And so I do not anticipate any time in the near, or I would even say medium term, you know, branching out, expanding into other, you know, other modalities or acquiring other concepts that are in, you know, other modalities. That being said, as I think about sort of the the, the more, you know, medium to long-term horizon and, you know, what potential liquidity options are for the company, I think I would be lying if I said that, you know, the opportunity for, you know, another exponential type, you know, brand to be formed that takes, you know, some of the premium players in each modality and says, hey, you know, we're going to do a combined concept here. Sorry, not combined concept, but sort of combined backend systems, combined memberships, making things easier for the end consumer to transact with a number of different brands that they already transact with. I think that could be interesting. Is that something that we're, you know, that's, you know, our North Star? Certainly not, but I think it could be interesting. Yeah, I, as you're as you're saying it, the the gears on my side are kind of turning as well. I look at it in a very similar way from that premium side, the combining um, whether it's technology, customer acquisition, giving consumers the option to go between a couple different concepts in a way that is not you know like a class pass third party yeah. could be super interesting. And there's a there's a lot that has to play out as we think about just getting back to, to life as normal before we can see some of those things through. And and with that, um, as we look to to wrap up, w- when you think about, we talked about a lot today from the, the brick and mortar to digital to culture and team. When you think about wrapping up the, the second half of this year already, we're, in, we're into the second half of the year, um, kind of define success. What are you most excited about and, and what, what has to happen for you to get to, through this, the end of the year and say like, hey, we did, we achieved all the milestones that we had set out to? Yeah. You know, first and foremost, I think that success, and this is, you know, a, a piece that we we don't have total control over by by any stretch, but of course we can we can play our own part in getting there. Is moving beyond the place that we are today with with the uncertainty of the pandemic, and I think you know getting to the end of this year and whether that's saying hey masks are here for the foreseeable future, so we're going to make sure that our clients have the best mask experience when they're in our studio space or. Hey, we're going to make sure we're advocating, you know, with our employees and with our clients that they should get vaccinated so we can move beyond masks, whatever that outcome is. And again, you know, we play uh, a part in it is making sure that we feel more settled going into 2022 as it relates to the pandemic, whatever that outcome looks like. To me, that's a, a critical part of, of success because we know that we are going to be living with this virus it is endemic and we are going to have to navigate around it. So critical part of success. The second piece for me is really a cultural shift with our team internally that will mean more to me than any metric that we actually accomplish. And if we can shift the culture, the metrics will actually come. And that's why I'm sort of highlighting this as kind of the critical success factor, which is our team has to shift its mindset from a recovery mindset to a mindset of winning. And specifically what I mean by that is for the last 16 months, 17 months, however long it's been that we've been in this sort of pandemic environment, it's been, okay, we just got to get back. We just got to get back open. We just got to get back to 80% of our pre-COVID numbers. We just got to get back to 90%. We just got to get back to our pre-COVID numbers. And I will say our team has really adopted that mindset. And it's time, in my opinion, that we shake that off because working this hard to say that we got back to where we were 16 months ago 
is not satisfying to me and is not success for this company and is not my job as a CEO here. And so the shift is saying, we're not going to get back to where we were. We're actually going to get back to 30% above where we were because that's what it's going to take to win in our category and to accomplish our goals. Um, And so for me, that's the biggest shift that I want to make sure that we here at Solid Core can make in the next four or five months. Yeah, I think that's really well said. I think, and that probably, you know, a lot of folks listening are will take that right back to their teams as well and say, we we need to get beyond this and start thinking about uh, how do we dictate and define success and not let it be, you know, just kind of what we're presented or living in or, or trying to deal with. So uh, I think it's a really uh, inspiring message and I think a, a good takeaway for folks. And, and with that, we'll actually, I think that's a good place. 